like it's not on yet. Uh, you know, thank you. Got How is it now? Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you all have a handout, and in, in, uh, the handout includes a brief summary of what we talked about. Last time, and a brief summary of what we're going to talk about today. So, I'd invite you to take a look at it. Um, last time, what we emphasized that spiritual counseling is not so much a technique or a method, because as we saw, there's a lot of different um, ways to do spiritual counseling, a lot of different approaches to it. But spiritual counseling is uh, an attitude, it's a vision. And in unity, the, the key attitude, the key vision for spiritual counseling is what we call the double vision, where we recognize that we are, um, in a sense, amphibious. We, we exist at two levels at the same time. Uh, we are spiritual beings and we are human beings. We have spiritual experiences and we have human experiences. They are in reality one and the same. They're not two different worlds, literally, or, or in reality they're not two different worlds. But it feels like two different worlds to us. So the, the work of the spiritual counselor is to know that these two worlds are not different. That the relative is not separate from the absolute. And that God is present fully. And the truth is there always, regardless of our human experience in any given moment. So we embrace fully the human aspect. We don't deny any of that. And at the same time, in embracing the human aspects, no matter how challenging they may be, we never forget nor negate the spiritual uh, element, which is the truth of who and what we are. So that's what I have called double vision. It's, again, it's really not double, but it feels double to us in, in human clothing. We talked about the, the vision of the spiritual counselor. We developed five uh, precepts, if you will, of the spiritual counselor, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. That the cause of our suffering is when we get this upside down, when we believe that we are human beings only, and when we become identified with and embroiled in the human drama. The solution to all suffering is to know the truth and that's ultimately the purpose of spiritual counseling is to help the individual know the truth within the midst of what appears to be a problem or a crisis. We talked about how prayer and meditation, prayer slash meditation, is our primary tool in unity. Prayer is not to God Prayer is not for anything other than to know the truth. And we talked about uh, we are co-creators of our reality. There's two dimensions of that. The one dimension is are we co-creators of our objective reality? And we did not address that question and I'm not going to address that question because that's not really part of our discussion. What is true and is part of our discussion is that we are co-creators of our subjective reality. We are co-creators, um, not just co-creators, we are creators of our interpretations, our meaning, whatever meaning, value, purpose, reality we give to our experiences, that's our responsibility. We may or may not be responsible for what comes to us. But we certainly are responsible for what we do with what comes to us. And that's the co-creation aspect that we focus upon in spiritual counseling. So those are the key ideas from last time. And now I want to talk about spiritual counseling from the perspective of the spiritual counselor, you. And what makes spiritual counseling unique? And what makes it challenging? What makes it powerful? What makes it very interesting? And there are a number of things that do. And I'm going to mention just a few. 
One of the things that we discover in counseling, particularly in spiritual counseling, is that the people, the circumstances, the situations that come to us very often challenge our own need for healing, our own blind spots, our own lack of self-awareness. So we see that the best preparation for spiritual counseling is our own personal work, our own healing work, our own prayer work, our own self-awareness work. This is really what's crucial. Yes, there are techniques and there is knowledge that's helpful to have, but first, foremost, and foundationally, uh, our own awareness of ourself, both as human beings and as spiritual beings. So that's the, that's the first priority for any effective spiritual counselor. We find that spiritual counseling, in a way that's um, somewhat unexplainable, will draw out from us whatever we need to see. I know in my own experience as a pastoral counselor, uh, it was almost comical how when I was dealing with an issue in my personal life, within 24 hours I was facing myself <laughs> in a different form in a counseling situation. And I found myself, as I was relating with another person, thinking, gee, I need to be working with this within myself. I need to be telling myself this same thing, you see. So it works both ways. There's the, that it, it, it isn't that we are a finished product, that we are the experts and we're somehow fixing someone else. If that's your vision, that's going to get uh, destroyed very quickly because that isn't the way it works. We, we are in this together. We are both learning. We are both spiritual humans. And we are both learning and growing through this particular process. So spiritual counseling, uh, as well as pastoral ministry in general, really requires us to do our own work. And that's both the, the joy and the challenge of it. The challenge of it is that when we go to sleep, sometimes we get, we get our knees scraped. But the joy of it is that it's a way of aligning our professional life with our spiritual life. And, and when I came into ministry, when I was interviewed for ministry many years ago, they, I was asked, why do I want to be a minister? And, and that was my response, is that I, I want my lives to be congruent. <laughs> I want my spiritual life, my professional life, to support one another and to reinforce one another. And certainly spiritual counseling does that like uh, just about nothing that... Uh, that I know of. So let's talk about the function of the spiritual counselor. You might be saying, well, the, spirit, the function of the spiritual counselor is to do spiritual counseling. But what is that? <laughs> what does that mean? You see, we all show up here with a different concept, a different idea of what spiritual counseling is. So just as an exercise, what I'd like to do, I'd like to ask you to take a minute and to just write some notes. If I were to ask you to describe, to, to, to write a word for spiritual counseling other than counseling, what word would you use? If you were not a, if the word spiritual counselor did not exist, what would you call yourself in that function? Who are you being as a spiritual counselor? How do you see yourself as a spiritual counselor? 
What do you see as your relationship with the counselee, the client? And just one or two words is, is, is plenty. The reason why I have you do this exercise is that spiritual counseling does not unfold from a recipe or a plan. When people come to you, uh, you won't have any idea what to say to them. I've been doing this work for many years, and I still haven't a clue what I'm going to say to people when they show up. That's the nature of the game, you see. Uh, I think a lot of folks, when they take a course in spiritual counseling, think, well, he's going to give us the answers that in this situation you do this, and in this situation you do that, and this is what you say when they ask this, and it doesn't work that way. The work of the spiritual counselor is determining who we're being, who are we in relationship to this other person. And it's out of that relationship with the other person that the process flows. It doesn't flow from some recipe or some formula or some set of answers that you're holding or sitting on. It unfolds from the relationship that you have with the counselor with or counselee congregant client. So what I'd like to do is write down some of these. Uh, let's just start over here with Kevin. Uh, and if you don't want to share what you've written, that's fine. Just say I pass. But I'm going to ask you to give me what one of the words you wrote down, Kevin. Um, well, I have phrased practical mystic. Okay. And what would that mean in terms of a relationship? Well, the mystic, uh, mystical to me, that's well. The other part of it was a, a oneness. Teaching and inspiring oneness. It's you know it's it's the, it gets back to the point about realizing the truth of who we are. We're all one. I mean, my personal feelings that if we all recognize we're all one. There wouldn't be any conflict. So, are you primarily a teacher? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay. So, when someone comes to you for counseling, you see yourself, your role, primarily that of teaching the individual. Not, not just information, but teaching at a deeper level. Yeah, at a deeper level, right. Great, thank you. Um, supportive or, or empathetic. Supporter, empathizer, what's the word you want to use? Um, Friend? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I was kind Advocate. of hearing in that. What a good listener. Listener, in what way would that be different from a friend, or would it be different from friend? Well, you're not really offering friendship as a listener. You're just, you're sort of holding sa uh, sacred space for them. Okay. I'm just going to put that. Sacred listening, we'll call it, okay? Okay. We'll just go over here to Tony. Do you have anything you want to add? I see said uh, spiritual guide. Okay, a guide. Good. Martha? Guide, teacher. Teacher and guide. Gardener. Gardener. Say a little more about that. Um, that the client or congregant is uh, growing to be who they are. So you're kind of cultivating that growth process? Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to run out of room before I run out of people. <laughs> Ken? Uh, first word that came to mind was midwife. Okay. A little bit like a gardener, but uh, different somewhat. <laughs> different, <laughs> different, different metaphor. Different crop. <laughs> yeah, different crop. Yeah. <laughs> Paula? Uh, I said facilitator. Okay. Sort of uh, helping the person reconnect with, with God or uh -huh. truth. 
and facilitator comes out of the word facile, which means to make easy, to make them. Um, uh, Judy? Reflection. But, okay, and who are you as a reflector? What is your role? To reflect back. To okay, that. so you would be like a mirror? Yes. Find a space here. And the two words I had, the first was gardener and the second one was facilitator. Okay, good. We got two gardeners, huh? Okay. I guess that's supposed to be an E. Active listener. An active listener, okay. Would that be like a sacred listener as well? And a mirror. And a mirror, okay. So there's a... There, there's, it's not just a passive listening, but it's a listening with a response. Barbara? Mirror. Mirror. Okay, Gayla? And I went along the guide as well as more empowerment and holding them higher than whatever the circumstances. Okay. So that's a little more than a, you want to stay with guide or you want to add another word in there? Well, if empowerment was my first word. Let's use that, empower. Clumsy word, but we know what it means. Okay. <coughs> okay. So let's look at some of these. Okay, this is very intriguing because these are not all the same. Right? Um. If I see myself as a teacher, my role in counseling is going to be different than if I see myself as a mirror. Okay? If I see myself as a guide, my role is going to be a little bit different than if I'm a sacred listener. If I see myself as a gardener or a midwife, it's going to be perhaps different than a friend or even an empowerer necessarily. Okay. So what's important is that each of us determine how we see our relationship with what I'll call the client. Because how we see our relationship with them will determine how the process unfolds. Now, you might say, well, you know, a spiritual counselor is all of these. And that's true. However, one of these is going to be your center of gravity. One of these is your primary operating mode. It has to be. Whether we consciously choose that or not, it's going to be. So when we decide who we are being as a spiritual counselor, then when we don't know what to say, which is most of the time, what is said, what is done, will unfold out of that relationship. If I'm a teacher, what I say and do will probably unfold differently than if I see myself as simply a mirror or a reflector or, or a listener. You know, as uh, the, the old song says, you've got to know when to hold them and when to, when to fold them. Well, it's the same thing in counseling. When do I speak? When do I just listen? When do I intervene? When do I support? When do I challenge? Well, a lot of that, if not most of it, will depend upon how I'm seeing myself, what I see myself as being. Now, it's interesting that there were some words that I did not hear. And I'm going to write some of those words up here. Now, some of you may have these as the, your second choice. I did not hear the word... Uh, Savior. Anybody have that? No? All right. How about guru? Did anybody have that one? Fixer? Mm -hmm. 
But you know what? The people that come to see you are going to be seeing you this way. Okay? That's why it's very, very important that you know who you're being in that relationship. Because if you don't know who you're being in that counseling relationship, you are going to default to their vision of who you are. And if you buy into one of these, write and tell me about it. I'd be interested in how it works out. As Dr. Phil says, how is that working for you? You see? Well, yeah? Can you talk more about guru, though? Because it's, a, it's huge in many spiritual paths. I'm using it in the colloquial sense. How I'm using the term guru is the question. I'm using it in the sense of setting yourself up as someone that has all the answers. And I do realize there's a more legitimate use of that word, and I'm not using it in that, in that sense. Yeah. Kevin? Would you say that's where authority would come in? Yeah, all of these carry the word expert or authority. And once again, we're going to be seen that way by most of the people that come to us. And that's, you know, that does our egos so uh, well and feels good. But it's also a trap, you see. Um, you know what happens to most saviors. We, we, just, we, 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 just, we just finished Good Friday, so. But you will re, you'll, you'll resurrect. That's the good news. But... Uh, um, so I invite you to play with that and to sit with it and uh, as you find yourself in these roles of being with other people who am I being? it's, a, it's an interesting exercise in any conversation even uh, with a friend or a colleague who am I being in this experience right here? So who we are, who we believe ourselves to be, that is, and how we see the relationship we have with the other person, that's going to create the process that unfolds in, in the counseling situation. In Chaos theory, the science of chaos theory, there are what's called attractors. When we look at a chaotic function, it looks like it's absolutely chaotic. But when we are able to study it from a mathematical point of view, we see that there are points that are centers of attraction for the movements. And the attractors for us in our relationship with other people are the beliefs about who we are and about how we see ourselves with, those other, with the other person. And if we don't do it consciously, we're going to be doing it unconsciously. So it's going to happen in, in every situation. We're always reflecting who we believe we are. And we're always reflecting how I see myself in relationship to other people, whether we know it or not. So it's better to be conscious of it and to be able to change it if we want to than to be unconscious of it and to fall victim to the results of that. So that's the function of the spiritual counselor. The next topic I'd like to talk about is that of some of the characteristics of an effective spiritual counselor. We've alluded to this a little bit already, but I've identified three, and I'd like you to maybe add to that list. To me, the key factor, the key feature of a, being an effective spiritual counselor is one's dedication to one's own spiritual growth. To, 
to be effective counselors, to be effective ministers, in unity at least, I think it's essential that we put our own growth, our own healing, our own self-awareness at the center of our life. Because that's where we minister from. We minister from who we are. We may use knowledge, we may use skills, we probably will, hopefully. And hopefully Unity Institute is providing some of those knowledge pieces and some of those skills. But the primary factor in ministry is what you're bringing, who you are. your own process of awakening, your own process of growth. Uh, another characteristic that I believe is essential in spiritual counseling, if not in any form of counseling, is authenticity. And authenticity, once again, requires that we be authentic with ourself. Another word for authenticity is honesty, sincerity. We can't be honest with someone else if we're not honest with ourselves. And if we're lying to ourselves or deceiving ourselves, then we are going to unwittingly deceive others in spite of what our conscious intentions may be. Because of the intimate nature of counseling, it demands that we risk shedding stereotyped roles, and be a real person. So we don't hide behind the role of counselor or minister. Sometimes we find folks that want to be ministers because the persona of the minister is very appealing. And it seems like something that I can hide behind. I can be whatever they think a minister is. But once again, that's a recipe for disaster. Effectiveness in ministry, particularly in pastoral ministry, means that we be real. Now, I want to add, this is appropriately real. Being real doesn't mean that we suddenly start using our congregants as our counselors, that we inappropriately share our problems or our issues. We're still in the role of being a minister. So the work is to remain in the role of minister, which means to serve and be authentic within that role. That, interestingly enough, increases, improves the effectiveness of that role when we can be authentic within it. Authenticity does not mean that we don't honor the commitments, the responsibilities, and the roles that, that we choose to engage in. But it means within that context, I'm not hiding behind anything. I'm not using that role as a shield or as a mask to hide. I'm being who I am and still honoring my commitment to you, my congregants, my, my counseling client. Realness, authenticity means not having to be a finished product, but to remain open to the struggle of becoming. And of course we are human, human becomings. You know, the, the, the language of the gardener, the language of the midwife, you know. All of us as human beings, we are whole and perfect, and yet we are becoming more. Our wholeness is in spiritual form. It's not always in physical form or mental form or emotional form. 
So we are already whole and perfect spiritually, but physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, in time and space, we are still becoming. We are evolving. And a third characteristic that I want to emphasize that's important in pastoral ministry and counseling is that of uh, empathy or compassion. Empathy, compassion is not the same as sympathy. It is not the same as pity. It is not feeling sorry for someone. It is not a codependent need to rescue somebody. But it's the ability to momentarily put ourselves into another person's experience. It's the ability to understand with our heart what it's like to be this other person. And at the same time, to know the reality is that we're not that person. <laughs> so we merge our identities momentarily, but we don't lose our own identity in the process. That's very important. And once again, the only way we can do that is to do our own work, our own healing, our own self-awareness, self-discovery work. Because if we don't, if we are blind to our own unmet needs, our own unhealed wounds, then we're going to either be blind to that in the people that come to us, or we're going to addictively identify with that in the people that come to us. And neither one of those work uh, at all. Henry Nowen, many years ago, came up with a term, he wrote a book, in fact, called The Wounded Healer. A very powerful term, I believe. Because it recognizes that our own wounds become the primary teaching, the primary resource that we have for working with others. This doesn't mean that my wounds have to be identical with yours in order for me to be an effective counselor. But what it does mean is that if I haven't addressed my own wounds, then I cannot address yours. And that as I have addressed and healed my own wounds, I can then speak to you with a real authority, not the false authority of the guru or the savior, but the real authority of someone that's lived this experience. That's why in the, in the 12 step programs, those of you that may be familiar with those, the, the function of the sponsor is so very important. The sponsor is not a guru or a savior but he or she is a person that, that has walked this path and that can speak to you with authority and help you walk your own journey in the process. Our imperfections can be a bridge or a barrier for others. They can be a bridge to others because we can relate with others. And sometimes it's appropriate to share our own experiences with others as a way of building that bridge. Because as we heard last week, the ability to be deeply heard and deeply understood is in and of itself very salubrious, very, very, has, a, has a deep healing quality to it. our ability to listen and to listen deeply and to listen not passively but to listen with a deep understanding and empathy and to convey to, to the other person the, the client that 
We are listening and we understand and we know and you are not alone in your experience. That is enormously powerful and probably the most potent healing force there is. Because it heals our deepest wound. Our deepest wound is always that of separation. And when we are working with other people that are in pain, we can't take their pain away from them. But perhaps we can convey to them, you are not alone in this. You see, that is the deepest form of suffering of all is when we feel alone. And in our society today, in our secular, materialistic Western culture, uh, isolationism and aloneness is endemic. And particularly when we are experiencing um, some pain or difficulty in our life that doesn't fit into the image that we see on the billboards and in, in, in the magazines and the movies, you see. And uh, the deepest suffering I've experienced personally and in working with others is the feeling that there's something wrong with me, the feeling that I'm all alone, that I can't be part of the world because of the pain that I'm in. That can be healed. That, that is an unnecessary suffering. So we can always be with someone no matter what their experience is. We can't take away their pain, but we can assuage their suffering by conveying to them in a deep way that we are indeed with them. And in knowing that, they realize beyond words that God is with them as well. Because as human beings, we often need, particularly in times of pain and suffering, we need God to be mirrored in the face of another human being. So dedication to one's own spiritual growth, uh, authenticity, and empathy. I see these as three very powerful characteristics of the effective spiritual counselor. And before we close, I would invite you to add to that list. Is there anything that comes to your mind that you might want to add? I guess it's a pretty good list then. It's left you wordlessly. So we'll, uh, we'll close with that. And of course, after we finish uh, the recording, we'll be open for some discussion. So thank you.